Hi, in this lecture, we are going to talk about the Weber Compression Refrigeration or VCR and the heat pump system. In this first part, we are going to talk about the fundamentals of the Weber Refrigeration System first. Now, let's consider the basic diagram of the refrigeration system and the heat pump. Shown here, you can see that the refrigeration system can be used to transfer heat from the cold refrigerated space to the warm environment. But this process of heat transfer cannot occur spontaneously. You need an external work okay, to transfer some amount of heat from low temperature reservoir to the high temperature reservoir. Now the working fluid that you use in the refrigeration system is called the refrigerant. Okay, the refrigerant could be either the vapor or gas. Okay, now with the refrigeration system here, when you supply external work, okay, you can maintain the temperature of the cold region here at temperature below the surrounding temperature. Now, if the objective is not to cool the cold region, but to heat up the warm region, as the diagram on your right hand side, the system will be called heat pump. The desired output is the heat load transfer to the warm region instead of the heat removal from the cold region here. Okay, so the difference between the refrigeration and heat pump is the objective. Refrigeration, the objective is to cool down the cold refrigerator space. On the other hand, for the heat pump, the objective would be to heat up the warm area. Now, let's first have a look at the application of the reverse Carnot cycle in the refrigeration system first. Now, if we apply the reverse Carnot cycle with the refrigeration system, you can see that the diagram will be shown here. Okay. The reverse Carnot cycle would be in the shape of the rectangle on the TS diagram. Okay, with the process change in the uh, uh, counterclockwise direction as shown here. Okay. Now, on your left hand side, it is a cyclic refrigeration device operating between two constant temperature reservoir. Okay, you have the cold temperature reservoir here, which is the heat source. and the high temperature res reservoir here, which is the heat sink. Okay. And with the reverse Carnot cycle, it will operate between two constant temperature reservoir. Now in this cycle, the refrigerant will be operated by circulating the refrigerant flow through a series of equipment. You can see that all processes are internally reversible. Okay, you, if you can remember, we have two isothermal processes and two isentropic processes in the reverse Carnot cycle. And also, the heat transfer between the refrigerant and each region occur with no temperature difference as well. So it means that the reverse Carnot cycle that we are going to consider here would be totally reversible. Okay, there will be no external or reversibility due to heat transfer. Now, if you start from point number four in the diagram, the refrigerant enter the evaporator. Okay, enter the evaporator as a two-phase vapor liquid mixture. In the evaporator, heat removal from the cold region is used to vaporize some 
refrigerant liquid into more vapor at constant temperature Tc here. In this step, the pressure and temperature of the refrigerant are constant. At the evaporator outlet, which is point 1, the refrigerant is then compressed adiabatically to point 2, where it is a saturated vapor. During this step, the temperature of the refrigerant increases from Tc to Th. Okay, while the pressure also increases. This hot vapor then rejects heat isothermally in the condenser at temperature Th. So this is your condenser. Okay, this is your evaporator. Okay. Then the hot vapor will reject heat isothermally in the condenser at temperature Th. Having lost some energy, the refrigerant now become a saturated liquid at the condenser outlet, which is number 3 here. And finally, the refrigerant returns to its original state by expanding adiabatically through a turbine, which is process 3-4. The temperature decreases from Th back to Tc, while the refrigerant pressure is decreased through the turbine as well. So 3, 4 here is the turbine. Okay. Now we can see that the reverse Carnot cycle using vapor as a working fluid is impractical not only in the isothermal process which is difficult to operate but also in the compression and expansion processes as well. From the TS diagram, the adiabatic compression occur in the zone of the vapor liquid mixture. This is the compressor, compressor, okay, it occur in the two-phase liquid zone here. So the compression in this zone will be called wet compression. This type of compression is normally avoided because the presence of liquid droplets could damage the compressor blades. In normal operation of the compressor, only vapor could be handled. This kind of compression is called dry compression. So this compression step must then be carried out in the vapor phase region. So it means that point number one should be shifted at least to the set vapor line. Okay, so the compression could take place in the vapor phase region. On the other side, in the turbine, it is also impractical to expand the saturated liquid at number three adiabatically to the vapor liquid mixture at number 4 as well. This expansion produces a relatively small amount of work when compared to the work required in the compression step. The work output from the actual turbine would be even smaller because of low turbine efficiency in this two-phase region. The expansion of vapor with relatively large amount of liquid droplets would also damage the turbine blades as well. So in this step, the application of turbine is therefore not suitable. It is normally replaced with a simple tottering valve which results in initial and maintenance cost saving. The actual vapor refrigeration system departs significantly from the Carnot refrigeration cycles in terms of the heat transfer between the system and the surroundings. You can see that if we want to have actual heat transfer between the system and the surrounding, we must have some temperature difference for heat transfer. 
So you can see that the temperature difference must be positive. Okay. So in this case, you can see that the temperature of the refrigerant must be higher than the temperature of the warm region or TH. Okay. TH prime must be greater than TH. And similarly, okay, if you want to remove the heat from the cold region or TC, the temperature of TC or the cold region must be higher than the temperature of the working fluid in the evaporator as well. Okay, so you can see that TC prime must be less than TC. Okay, so th for the actual vapor refrigeration system, you can see that the temperature range would be wider than what that would be in the reverse Carnot cycle. Okay, this is for reverse Carnot cycle. You will operate between the temperature range of TH and TC, but for the actual cycle, you will operate between TH prime and TC prime. This is the actual cycle. Okay, so you can see that with the wider temperature range in operation, you will consume more work than the ideal Carnot cycle. W work net in will be higher higher than the reverse canal. Okay. Now let's start with the simple system, which is called the ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle. We already know that to operate an actual um, vapor compression refrigeration system, you cannot use the reverse Carnot. So the, the process will consist of the first one. The first one is isentropic process. This is the isentropic compression. This is isentropic compression. Okay, so you have to start with point number one, which is a compressor inlet. It has to be at least sat vapor. You have to make sure that point number one, which is the compressor inlet, it must be at least saturated vapor or superheated vapor to make sure that you don't have the liquid droplet in the compressor. Okay. So after that, when you compress your refrigerant vapor from number one to number two, you then cool it down, but cool it down isothermally is very difficult. So you cool it down in an isobaric process instead. So two to three would be isobaric. Okay, isobaric process. Now you have to cool it down until it reaches point number three, which is the saturated liquid. Okay, you cool it down to saturated liquid. Sometimes you may cool it down to subcool liquid. Okay, it could be cool it down to subcool liquid. As well. Okay, so at least it should be cooled to the saturated liquid. Okay, and then after that, instead of expanding the liquid through a turbine, we have already mentioned that expansion of the liquid will give you 
not much work okay liquid does not expand so much okay so instead of expanding in an iso isentropic manner from 3 to 4 prime we will not do this one we will expand it in an Joule Thomson expansion JT expansion okay this would be isentropic process isentropic process so you can see that in this isentropic process the enthalpy of the refrigerant would be constant so it means that H3 and H4 would be the same H4 equal to H3 okay H4 equal to H3 and you can see that the part it will move downward to the right hand side because the JT expansion or isentropic expansion here is not isentropic you will have entropy increase so in this process you have H which is constant but you have increase in entropy delta S must be greater than zero okay so this is why the part from 3 to 4 is moving down but to the right hand side with increase in entropy okay so you can see that you have some vapor generated from this flash through the wall it means that some amount of vapor will be generated okay by using the heat from the liquid itself some amount of heat from the liquid will be used to vaporize itself into vapor okay so at point number four here you have more vapor and after that from four back to one you will enter the evaporator okay to remove heat from the cold region your refrigerant will be vaporized into set vapor again okay this process also take place in an isobaric manner as well okay now if we talk about the ideal vapor compression refrigeration system you have to know automatically that number one here at the compressor inlet it has to be at set vapor okay and at point number three here which is the condenser outlet you have to know automatically that it must be set liquid this is ideal VCR okay now we may use the other kind of thermodynamics diagram okay to help us solve the refrigeration problem as well instead of using temperature and entropy diagram we may use pressure and enthalpy diagram here pressure and enthalpy diagram you can see that for the um, isentropic compression it will follow constant entropy line constant entropy line okay from 2 to 3 which is isobaric the line will be just a horizontal line okay at constant pressure from 2 to 3 this is isobaric okay isobaric and 3 to 4 it will be just simple vertical line because it's isenthalpic you have constant enthalpy okay isenthalpy and finally from 4 back to 1 it would be a simple horizontal line again because it's isobaric as well okay so you can see that uh, by using pH diagram the shape of the refrigeration cycle will be um, pretty much simpler than 
what we have on the um, TS diagram. Now let's have a look at the real equipment. If we have a refrigerator, a household refrigerator, you can see that um, we have a compressor. Okay, compressor. It will compress the refrigerant vapor. Okay, from the evaporator coil. Okay, and then the compressed vapor would be at a higher temperature and pressure. Okay, and then this refrigerant vapor will be condensed in the condenser coil. Condenser coil is normally located outside. Okay, may be attached to the outside wall of the refrigerator. After condensing, okay, the refrigerant will be turned into the liquid again. It will pass through an expansion valve, okay, to a lower pressure and a lower temperature, okay, and this refrigerant will absorb heat inside your refrigerator through the evaporator coil, okay, and it will be turned into the vapor and continue the cycle again. So this is what we have in the real household refrigerator. Okay. Now in the calculation part, okay, for the refrigeration system analysis, okay, you can see that in each process we have energy transfer. For example, in process one two, okay, you have work transfer, you have work in, okay. From the energy balance, you can calculate the work input. That would be the mass flow rate multiplied by enthalpy change, okay, between point one and point two. Okay, the heat rejection to the environment or the heat rejection to the surrounding QH in process 2-3 can be calculated from the mass flow rate multiplied by H2 minus H3 as well. In process 3-4, you don't have heat transfer between the system and the surrounding. It's just an isentropic flash, isentalpic flash, sorry. So the enthalpy is constant. Okay, so H3 equal to H4. And finally, the heat removal from the cold refrigerator space, QL. It can be calculated from energy balance in process 4-1. QL equal to M dot multiplied by H1 minus H4. Okay, so simply they can be calculated from energy balance in each process. Now the capacity of the heat removal in the refrigeration. We normally use the word tons of refrigeration. Okay, you might have heard uh, this term or this unit before. The tons of refrigeration. Ton of refrigeration is not a unit of mass or weight. It's, it's the unit of heat transfer. Okay, ton of refrigeration. The ton of refrigeration is the cooling capacity, okay, which is defined as the heat energy absorbed when a short ton, a short ton which is equal to two thousand pound, okay, of ice, okay, melts during a twenty hours, twenty-four hours day, okay, melts during a twenty-four hours day. The ice assumed to be solid as um, 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 0 degrees Celsius initially and become water at um, 0 degrees Celsius as well. Okay, so it's just melt, changing only the solid into the liquid form. Okay, the energy absorbed by the ice is the latent heat of the ice time the total weight okay time the total weight so if you have one short ton one short ton is just 2000 pounds it's different from the metric metric tons that you may be familiar with okay metric tons is 1000 kilogram which is about 2200 pounds Okay, so the metric tons and short tons are not equal. 
Okay. So this amount of heat, one ton of refrigeration, would be equal to one tons of refrigeration. Will be equal to two thousand pound of ice. Okay, multiplied by the latent heat of melting of ice. That would be one hundred and forty-four um, BTU per pound. Okay, and then divided by twenty-four hours per day, within the time period of 24 hours. So 2000 multiplied by 144 and divided by 24 hours that would be 12,000 BTU per hour. Okay so this value you may uh, have seen this value before. One ton of refrigeration is 12,000 BTU per hour. Okay so if you go by uh, new air conditioning okay or refrigeration system you can check whether you have what you hope for or not okay if you buy an air condition with the capacity of one ton you can check whether you have um, 12,000 BTU per hour of heat removal from the cold region or not okay and in the other unit it would be equivalent to 200 BTU per min Okay, it would be equal to 211 kilojoule per min or 3.517 kilowatt here. Now, let's have a look at the performance evaluation. We have um, seen the performance evaluation of the refrigeration system before. It is defined in terms of the coefficient of the performance or COP. Okay, so COP can be defined for refrigerant and for heat pump. Okay, they are different because they have different objectives. Okay, for refrigeration, COP would be the cooling effect divided by work input. So that would be QL divided by W net. For heat pump, that would be the heating effect. This is what you want it would be QH divided by W net in. Okay. And the relationship between COPR and COPHP would be as, as follow here. COPHP equal to COPR plus 1. The maximum COP can be achieved if your cycle is a reverse Carnot cycle. If your cycle is a reverse Carnot cycle, COPR and COPHP can be calculated by using the absolute temperature values. Because we already know that the heat transfer will depend on the temperature level. So you can just substitute the terms of Q with the terms of the absolute temperatures. Okay, so COP of reverse Carnot for the refrigeration, you can just calculate from TL over TH minus TL COP of the reverse Carnot operating as a heat pump you may calculate it from um, TH over TH minus TL okay may I remind you again that our temperature value must be in absolute temperature value okay now in the last slide here okay let me explain about some properties of the refrigerant and how we select uh, the refrigerant to be used for our application okay the first refrigerant which is commercially used is the ethyl ether okay it is uh, actually used in 1850 this is the first kind of refrigerant use in the world okay it's not used in commercial anymore I guess this one ethyl ether the next one is ammonia ammonia is still used pre at present okay it is typically used in industrial and heavy commercial sector 
okay is this normally used in the food production factory is this normally used in the ice production factory okay to cool down the vegetables cool down the fish or meat for example the advantage of ammonia is that it has low cost okay it's very cheap and and it's it can give you high COP okay high heat transfer coefficient okay and it could be easily detected when it leaks okay easily detect when it leaks because it's very smelly okay it has no effect on the global warming no effect on the ozone layer the only disadvantage is that it is toxic you may have heard the news uh, from the television or from the newspaper that if you have a leak leakage of ammonia from the ice production plant you may have some casualties okay someone may get sick or even die okay so this is ammonia we still use it okay the other one is um, sulfur dioxide methyl chloride or ethyl chloride these are early refrigerant used in the light commercial and household sector they are very toxic highly toxic indeed okay and they caused serious illness and death in 1920s so they are once used in the household sector and now they are banned not used anymore because they are very toxic okay the other group of refrigerant that we use would be the group of hydrocarbon for example the propane ethane ethylene and etc okay this kind of light hydrocarbon are normally used to provide cooling in the chemical process industries okay for example in the olefin process or olefin factories okay and now they are being investigated to be applied in other sectors as well okay the next group would be carbon dioxide and air they are used in air conditioning of the aircraft okay carbon dioxide and air okay now the remaining part of the refrigerant would be called the chlorofluorocarbon refrigerant or CFC chloro chloro fluoro carbon okay we once used this CFC in the air conditioning system in our household refrigerator but it's now fed out okay not used popular popularly anymore okay because the CFC can damage the also layer it's not environmental it's not environmentally safely because of the chlorine inside the molecules okay R11 R12 R22 they are chlorofluorocarbon or CFC now we now use the kind of refrigerant which is environmentally friendly okay which is environmentally friendly which is HFC HFC is hydrofluorocarbon we don't have chlorine in the molecules of the refrigerant anymore you can see here for example R134A you don't have chlorine inside the molecules okay this kind of refrigerant is environmentally friendly it do not damage the ozone layer okay it is now replacing the um, fade out CFC okay sometimes you may not use the pure refrigerant but use a mixed refrigerant or a blend refrigerant okay for example R502 is a kind of brand refrigerant okay to improve the performance of the system 
502 here is the blend of R115 and R22 here. It is normally used in the commercial refrigeration, such as those found in the supermarkets. Okay. So, the kind of the refrigerant that we are going to choose will depends on several selection criteria. Apart from depends on the characteristic of the PT relationship, okay, we have also consider the other factors as well, such as toxicity, corrosiveness, flammability, chemical stability, latent heat of vaporization, and also the cost as well. So you can see that to choose a kind of refrigerant to be used in our system, you have to consider many factors. Okay. All right then. I guess that would be all for this part. Okay. In the next part, I'm going to uh, show you the um, examples of how we calculate the ideal VCR. Okay. See you next time.